more taxonomy. Where do cells come from? If we look off the coast of Indonesia, off the coast of Australia, the various places in Mexico, we can find structures that we call stromalites. Stromalites are actually massive accumulations of tiny prokaryotic organisms which have built upon layer upon layer into these sort of massive footstool shaped structures. The only reproducing portions of these structures are actually on the surface. Accumulations of tiny prokaryotic microscopic organisms. If we look in the fossil records, the geologic structures here on Earth, we can actually find ancient fossilized remnants of ancient prokaryotes that look exactly like the modern stromalites today. The ancient fossilized stromalites have layer upon layer appear to have grown in the same kind of aquatic environments near the coastline of different oceans or shores and appear to be made from the same kinds of tiny microscopic organisms. This is a photo of one such fossilized stromalite. Notice the penny that's in the photo in the top, almost middle portion of the photo. Gives you a relative idea of size. You can see that it must have taken centuries of, of slow growth, layer upon layer, for this type of structure to form, similar to what we see today. Just slow, progressive growth. Now, scientists have looked thoroughly at the biochemistry and the geologic structure. They find that, sure enough, this, these aren't just crystals or unusual geologic formations that there is more organized structure to the building material that was used to make these layers. In fact, if we look at these geologic structures that are the fossilized remains of the ancient prokaryotes, we find that they're about three billion years old, give or take a few billion years, or tenths of a billion years, and if we look at them microscopically, we can see these well-organized filaments, as in the photo on this slide. If we take a look at the organization of this little filament, we can actually find similar types of structures today of organisms, microorganisms, that have the same kind of arrangement of their internal parts. You might recall I mentioned when we covered the material in Chapter 1 that classically trained biologists had quite a few distinctive criteria to call something an organism. But as microbiologists, we're going to use more fundamental, simpler criteria. We actually have three criteria that we will use. If we want to call something a microorganism, it needs to have some method of metabolism and some method of heredity. Each of those would be what we call mechanisms. A mechanism of metabolism, a mechanism to undergo hereditary or passing genetic material along from one generation to another. And the third criteria that we need to include is adaptation. A microorganism must be able to adapt or alter its growth in metabolism and hereditary processes based upon responding to its environment. To do all of these things, we need some kind of building blocks. And of course, scientists are working diligently to figure out how, if possible, based on what kinds of materials were present three and a half billion years ago, some of these biochemicals assembled to produce structures that we recognize today as prokaryotic cells. You'll also recall that a little bit earlier we described five kingdoms for classification of organisms. The five kingdom system was used for a few decades, it was very popular, but in the 1990s, and maybe even earlier slightly, it became evident that mm, the kingdom Monera and the kingdom Protista just weren't working. In terms of classification and organization, the diversity was just a little 
not quite balanced. The Kingdom Protista in particular was very problematic in terms of what to classify where and how. At, at one point, an 11 kingdom system was proposed, essentially dividing up the Kingdom Protista into some additional smaller kingdoms. An A kingdom system was proposed where we had separated the Monerans into two distinct kingdoms of Bacteria and Archaea, and then the Kingdom Protista divided into three separate kingdoms. There's still quite a bit of discussion about what to do with some of these different groups. What microbiologists proposed in the late 1960s and early 1970s was instead of grouping organisms based on some of the criteria that had been used in the earlier kingdom system, instead group organisms together based on their cell structure, or what we now call the domain system for classification and taxonomy. classification system that we will use and is more accepted nowadays are the three domains. Domain bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. The domain bacteria and archaea, these are both prokaryotic celled organisms, but distinctively different enough in their biochemistry and their organization and structure. The scientists determined in the 1960s and 70s that these are three distinctly different domains. And the prokaryotes are two distinctly different groups of prokaryotes. Carl Woese, Leslie Orgel, and Francis Crick, with thorough analysis and determination, clearly identified distinctive differences in archaea that you don't find in bacteria and biochemical characteristics of bacteria that you don't find in archaea. We also find that because of those distinct differences, the archaea tend to be extremophiles. They grow in very unusual environments that most other organisms on Earth can't possibly tolerate. Now, the domain eukarya looks like it's a small group, but of course we know that in this domain we find every other kind of organism that has eukaryotic cell structure. So that would include the plants, animals, fungi, and all of the different kinds of diverse types of protists. Since we're using simple criteria, for organiza organization, that means it's a little bit easier to figure out what to do with the protists, since we can lump them all into the domain eukarya and then work on smaller and smaller groupings further down the classification scheme. This table illustrates and defines some of the differences between the three different domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Please take a look at some of the unique differences, especially between the bacteria and the archaea. If you look at the lipids, protein synthesis, the kind of genetic material, even the polymerases that are used, there are distinct differences between the two that help scientists figure out these are two distinctly different types and groups of organisms. And of course, the eukarya, very different from the first two domains. As scientists, we want to be able to describe mechanisms that can explain how something occurs or why something happens. And so, how do we determine the possible formation of prokaryotic cells, what kinds of mechanisms or events possibly occurred 3.5 billion years ago that allowed for different biochemicals to assemble and start to function in a fashion that we now describe as cell function. Well, it was clear, if you take a look at even basic fundamental prokaryotic cells, that there appeared to be barriers or separations of inside and outside. And so at some point, some type of either bubble or little vesicle possibly formed 3.5 billion years ago and distinctly separated what was occurring on the inside of the bubble versus what was on the outside. 
There are actually different kinds of clays and different kinds of materials that we can find on Earth or even deposited on Earth from comets and meteorites that have these kind of s sort of separation capabilities to make little bubbles or vesicles. Scientists have looked for all kinds of examples, all possible means for the compartmentalization and the separation of different biochemical activities. And little by little, they've pieced it all together um, with some possible examples. Believe it or not, there's a scientific group of researchers right now that are trying to synthesize artificial cells that would have the capability of performing different metabolic and biochemical reactions separated by barriers or membranes and performing different kinds of functions. Scientists look for ways to explain how there's a possible relationship between pro and eukaryotic cells if in fact prokaryotic cells gave rise to eukaryotic cells and sure enough we seem to have some plausible explanations and then evidence physical evidence to confirm what we found there are even some living representative examples that we can see here on earth now in terms of the formation of a eukaryotic nucleus it was suggested that a mechanism that could have occurred was the infolding or the invagination of the cytoplasmic membrane that would capture or contain the genetic material and eventually form that specialized structure that we call a nucleus. The infolded internal cytoplasmic membrane would then become what we now call the endomembrane system or endoplasmic reticulum. In terms of the other additional internal structures that we see in many eukaryotic celled organisms, we find that at some point billions of years ago, ancestral aerobic prokaryotes essentially became endosymbionts or started to live inside the cytoplasm of these nucleated cells. Now, ages ago, again billions of years ago, they were distinctly recognized as prokaryotic microorganisms. In fact, they're described as heterotrophic. Heterotrophic means the organism eats all kinds of different types of food. Very wide, diverse diet of organic materials. The heterotrophic aerobic prokaryotes, we suggest, have over the billions of years modified their structure a little bit and developed into what we now call mitochondria. The mitochondria can be found in a variety of eukaryotic cells of plants and animals, especially. There are ancestral photosynthetic prokaryotes that scientists propose started to grow and live inside of nucleated eukaryotic cells. They would still function as photosynthetic prokaryotes, but establish essentially an endosymbiosis with the nucleated eukaryote. Both were benefiting from the production of the nutrients from this ancestral photosynthetic prokaryote. But eventually, over hundreds of thousands of years, this ancestral prokaryote starts to lose its distinctive characteristics and turned into what we now call a chloroplast. There's quite a bit of biochemical evidence to support these concepts. If we take a look at mitochondria and chloroplasts, they grow and divide on their own. Both mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own pieces of circular DNA. They generate their own kinds of material from these pieces of DNA. The size of the ribosomes. The ribosomes in mitochondria and chloroplasts are 70S ribosomes. The ribosomes in prokaryotic cells are 70S. All of these bits and pieces of information are, have been used in the last few decades to establish another theory in biology. Now, a theory in biology is simply a hypothesis or a question that has been posed 
and then investigated, and then thoroughly substantiated. So unlike when someone says, let's say in forensics, that they have a theory about something, we hear that word used all the time. When it's used in that casual manner or in a distinctly different discipline, it means something entirely different. A theory, a scientific theory, is a statement that has been well supported by data that was accumulated through exhaustive research to clearly essentially tell us yes or no. Yes, this does happen, and we have evidence to suggest that it really has happened, or no, just don't have enough evidence to support that particular concept or idea. So when scientists were trying to determine if in fact there was some type of relatedness between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, and if in fact the organelles might have occurred at some point between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, sure enough, they found physical biochemical evidence to support that concept. There are even living examples today of organisms that essentially are doing just those things. We have a species of, of protist called Jardia. Jardia is a single-celled eukaryotic organism that has no mitochondria and no intracellular bacteria. In fact, Jardia is an anaerobe. It really doesn't need any kind of extra assistance in growth because it can grow in an oxygen-free environment on very simple metabolic processes. Some paramecium species have no mitochondria, but instead of having mitochondria, they have intracellular bacteria that are performing the same kind of function. In other words, I prefer to say that the paramecium examples are living fossils. Now, there are some biologists that don't like to use that phrase, since a fossil has a very distinctive quality to it. But the species of paramecium and different kinds of protists that have intracellular bacteria that function just like a mitochondria would function in our cells, to some microbiologists, is clear evidence that the concept that some of the organelles that we see today in eukaryotes are derived from endosymbionts or ancient ancestral prokaryotes that started to live inside the nucleated eukaryotes um, is in fact well substantiated and gives rise to our additional theory in biology which is the theory of endosymbiosis that the formation of the nucleus and organelles that we now see in eukaryotic organisms were originally derived from endosymbiotic prokaryotic cells. So the living examples of Jardia lamblia that have no mitochondria and no intracellular bacteria and paramecium species like Paramecium aurelia which have bacteria that function like mitochondria, are good research tools to thoroughly demonstrate the possibility and the support for the theory of endosymbiosis. More evidence to support the theory of endosymbiosis are the ribosomes. I've already mentioned that if we take a look in the cytoplasm of prokaryotes, ribosomes have a size we call 70S. The S stands for Svedberg unit, which is a sort of unit measurement for ultracentrifugation, referring to mass or how big something is. If we look at the ribosomes in a eukaryote, we only find 70S ribosomes inside the organelles that we call mitochondria and chloroplasts which we are proposing, and there's evidence to support, were evolved or have evolved from intracellular endosymbiotic prokaryotes. So 70S ribosomes in prokaryotic cytoplasm, 70S ribosomes in eukaryotic mitochondria and chloroplasts. Now if we look in the cytoplasm of a eukaryote, those ribosomes are much larger and are called ADS ribosomes in the cytoplasm of a eukaryote. 
additional evidence to support the theory of endosymbiosis, in addition to the two or three that we've mentioned so far, well, we find that mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own single circular DNA. We've already briefly mentioned that, so they have their own essentially chromosomes. They will grow and replicate inside of a eukaryotic cell in the cytoplasm, independent of the cell division of the eukaryotic cell and the nucleus of the eukaryotic cell. There's quite a bit of biochemistry that clearly determines the distinction between organelles and eukaryotic cell structures in general, and then similarities between organelles and prokaryotes. So there's quite a bit of data now that supports this theory of endosymbiosis. Now, so if we take a review of the different theories that we've discussed so far, we have the cell theory, we have the theory of biogenesis, we have the germ theory, we have the theory of endosymbiosis. All of them have been well documented and well supported in the scientific study of microbiology and biology in general.